Good afternoon. On behalf of all of us here at Discovery Park of America, thank you for joining us for this inaugural panel of the 2021 Military History and Armed Forces Symposium. My name is Nathaniel Newland. I am the Assistant Director of the Education Department here at Discovery Park, which means that I get to uh, take part in a lot of really cool programs. Uh, I can honestly say that there isn't anything that I've ever done with Discovery Park that I didn't like. Uh, but this has been the greatest honor of my career thus far, bringing together all of the speakers and panelists, um, reenactors and authors uh, for this event. I, I know you will enjoy their experiences as much as I've enjoyed corresponding with them over the past several weeks. Uh, we, of course, want to extend a special uh, thank you to our sponsors, Union City Coca-Cola and Dixie Gunworks, uh, for making this event possible. And of course, if you are a member of Discovery Park, we thank you as well for making this possible. If you're not yet a member, <laughs> if you're not yet a member, we encourage you to take that step as you leave today and become a stakeholder in Discovery Park's mission of inspiring children and adults to see beyond. This will be the first of many panels and speaking engagements over the course of the weekend. And you can find the full schedule on the back of the lanyard you were given as you entered. I see pretty much everyone has one. I had mine, I just took it off. Uh, or you can also find that on our website, discoveryparkofamerica.com. As a reminder, there are more reenactors outside on the Great Lawn. Uh, and just a couple of announcements. The Black Hawk helicopter that was going to be landing tomorrow will instead be landing Sunday around 11.30 and taking off around 3 o'clock. Uh, and of course, if you have not yet seen the new Matthew Brady exhibit that's in the real foot room, that's right up those stairs and through those double doors there. It's pretty neat. Uh, Matthew Brady was, of course, the father of photojournalism. This panel, hosted by Commander Leanne Braddock, U.S. Navy retired, will discuss the experiences of women uh, in the United States military. Commander Raddick is very well acquainted with this topic as she uh, served our country for 24 years in the United States Navy before retiring in 2004. Directly after retiring, she worked again with the Navy to co-author the Combat Operational Stress Control Program, uh, which was responsible for training 150,000 active duty sailors. She is now licensed as a marriage and family therapist and practices out of Jackson, Tennessee. She holds a Master of Education and Educational Leadership from the University of North Florida and a Master of Arts in Counseling from Harding University. Commander Braddock has taught classes and led numerous groups dealing with a variety of issues from addiction to parenting and brings to this panel a perspective uh, befitting of such a host. I can think of no one more fitting. Uh, without further ado, Commander Leanne Braddock. Well, good afternoon. Good, good. It's good to see all of you. And welcome to the panel, Service with Honor, Women in the Military. I am very humbled to share the stage with this group of outstanding military women who I will introduce to you in just a few minutes. Ancient artifacts show that women fought as warriors as early as the 17th century BC in Egypt, also during the Trojan War in Greece during the 13th century BC, and in fact, in every century since then. Just recently, the grave of a Viking was identified as that of Burka, a female Viking warrior, dated about 1000 AD. Closer to home, during the American Revolutionary War, a handful of women put on the, the uniform of the Continental Army, fought and received pensions for their war service. During the American Civil War, over 400 women, mostly disguised as men, fought alongside their male counterparts in both the Union and the, the Confederate armies. And over 6,000 women served as nurses, cooks, laundresses, and clerks in the Union Army alone. Some even served as spies. 
So even though women have been on the front lines since the Revolutionary War, the role of women in the military has been debated throughout American history. When I was commissioned an ensign in the Navy in February 1981, and that was kind of a long time ago, women were serving on, just, just a handful of women were serving on Navy ships. However, beginning in 1993, Congress approved women to serve on combatant ships, such as the Navy's aircraft carriers. Today, they serve on all Navy ships, including submarines. In 2013, the Secretary of Defense lifted the ban on women in direct ground combat. By January 2016, all military occupations were open to women without exception. Today, roughly 270,000 women serve in the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard on active duty, and another 150,000 serve in the National Guard and Reserve. That means that over 429,000 of America's women currently wear the cloth of our nation. I want you to meet some of them today and let them tell you a bit about their military careers. Before we begin, let me state that the views expressed by the panelists here are their own and do not represent the official policy of the Department of Defense or the Department of Homeland Security. First, Commander Sheree Williams, who is a native of Evanston, Illinois. She currently serves as the head of Navy Enlisted Distribution Support at Navy Personnel Command, Millington, Tennessee. Commander Williams' previous assignments include positions in recruiting and training at Great Lakes, Miami, and Millington. She was officer in charge of Great Lakes Maritime Academy, and she served sea tours aboard the aircraft carrier USS John F. Kennedy and the destroyer USS Mustin. Commander Williams holds a bachelor's degree in mathematical sciences from Florida A&M University, an MBA from Truro International University, and a Master of Arts in Defense and Strategic Studies from the Naval War College. She has served in the Navy for 25 years. Commander Williams? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Leanne, for such a well-rounded and such an awesome introduction. As she stated, 25 years um, to me seems like a very, very long time. Some, some of you guys, it might seem like just a little dust or a speck or moment in time. But the real question is, how did I get here 25 years ago? You know, most individuals, when they are young, they aspire to be something. Some of them say, hey, I want to be a doctor or a nurse, a lawyer. I want to be a firefighter, a police officer. You name it. You hear elementary students across the world talk about what it is that they want to be. You don't often, or I have never often, heard someone say, I want to stand and serve in the military. And if you do come across that individual, that young individual, it's probably because they've had some kind of influence. Now, as I reflect back, 
that short span ago. I don't ever recall wanting to be anything specific. I don't ever recall having a conversation with any of my classmates, my teachers, my family about what it is specifically I wanted to be when I grew up. And that could have been positive or negative. As Leanne stated, I grew up in Evanston, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago, right on the north shore of Chicago. And there wasn't a great military influence in my town of Evanston, but a little bit further north in Great Lakes there were, because that's where the Navy's only current boot camp is. However, where I resided, there was not. My path was a little bit untraditional than most. I did not come to the military right after high school. In fact, I went to Ohio State University when I graduated high school, and I spent a year there. After the end of my first year, I had no more money to continue. So hence, I had to go home. That's not uncommon for individuals. However, what you do next is really an important thing. And when I got home, my grandmother said, hey, I heard about the military and they offer money for school. Why don't you go check them out? And so I did. Now I wanna round back to when I talked about young individuals growing up and saying what it is that they wanted to be. At this juncture, I still had not pinpointed what it was that I wanted to be. However, the military allowed me to be almost all of those things that I stated. Now, how is that possible? When I went to the recruiting station in February as well, but it was in 1981, it was 1996, the recruiter gave me a test. And that test was to see where it was, I was as far as aptitude, and maybe kind of discertain what it is that I probably could do in the military. When I got my test back, they told me that I was going to be a cryptological technician interpreter, meaning that I would study foreign languages in the military. I had no idea what that was, nor did I know if I was very interested in it, but I rolled with it because they said they were gonna give me money for school. However, my very first duty station in the military was the President's Hospital, National Naval Medical Center, Bethesda, Maryland, and I was a hospital corpsman, which is equivalent to a medic in the military, mostly in the Army branch. So I go back to saying, some young people say they want to be doctors or nurses in the medical field. Here I am on my first journey, getting to explore a path in the medical field. After leaving the National Naval Medical Center of Bethesda, the President's Hospital, I was one of the few individuals who was afforded an opportunity to go back to school, and it was awarded a four-year scholarship, full ride to attend Florida A&M University, all while still serving in the military. However, that was my full-time position, was to go back and to finish the path that I had started at Ohio State University. Most children don't say they wanna be students as a career, all right, however, in the military, you get that opportunity. When I went to Florida a and University, I chose a major, and it was mathematical sciences. Now, that doesn't definitely give you on a direct path. It had nothing to do with being in the medical field, nor did it have anything to do with some of the other things that I would get to touch upon during my services in the military. But let me tell you how this all goes full circle. When I got to my very first ship, I got to be the navigator. I got to drive a ship. I got to combat pirates. I got to launch missiles, missiles that I had never heard of before. Tomahawk missiles, ASRock missiles, torpedoes, all types of weaponry, as well as get to drive that ship. On top of that, I got to learn to be the engineer, learning all of the gas turbine systems that make their ship run and propel through the water. And in addition, I got to do something else. I got to command the ship while the CEO was sleeping as an officer of the deck. Now, when I was in elementary school, 
I didn't have those type of conversations with any of my friends, nor do I know any young people who might be having those type of conversations right now. However, without even knowing, I got to embark on all of those typical careers that people dream and talk about as youngins and sometimes aspiring adults going to college. But my journey didn't stop there. I did serve on two ships, actually three. I served on USS Mustin, which was a destroyer. I served on the USS John F. Kennedy, which is an aircraft carrier as the electrical officer. I also served on the USS Comfort, which is a hospital ship. We have two of them, the Comfort and the Mercy. I have served on a frigate as well. So I have served on several different platforms of ships, none of which I would have envisioned as a young person saying what I wanted to be. Now, a lot of young individuals say, I want to go in the education realm. I want to become a teacher because teachers teach us. They make us happy. They tell us right and what's wrong. Now, how did I become a teacher in the military? Well, after I left the John F. Kennedy, I was sent to Northwestern Michigan College in Traverse City, Michigan, to be the Naval Science Professor of the Great Lakes Maritime Academy. And this was my job. Who would have ever known that I would have become a professor, all while serving in the military? Hence, the cycle in the circle continues. Now, how does that land me to where I am now? The head of enlisted distribution for the entire Navy. Now, what does that mean? All of those sailors who say, this is what I want to do, and this is where I want to go next, that's what me and my team provide for them. We are the individuals who select their assignments and say, hey, this is what's next. So that becomes full circle, because I was once in that position. However, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the job that I had prior to the one that I'm curving serving in. As the National Officer Programs Officer for the Navy, I had the opportunity to recruit every particular career and genre that the Navy holds. The same ones that we hold in society. That means our doctors, our lawyers, our dentists, our nurses, our chaplains, our engineers, our civil engineers, our cooks, as you talked about, our surface warfare officers, our pilots, our Navy SEALs, our intel officers. Each and every platform under the Navy's officer corps is what my team and I did nationally for the United States Navy. Now, why do I want to talk about that? Because if we go back to the beginning of my story, I talked about, as young individuals, we talk about, well, I didn't, but most kids do, what we want to be when we grow up. And there are so many individuals that do not realize that every particular profession and career that society has is honed in the United States military, not just in the Navy. And you have the opportunity to be able to embark on those careers as well. So my experiences have not been limited, but very vast. And I'm actually glad that as a young individual, I did not pick one particular career or profession that I wanted to aim toward. And why is that? Because I have had the privilege over the last 25 years to embark on most of all of them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Commander Williams. Next, Commander Rebecca Waltower, a native of Newport News, Virginia, serves as the Deputy Sector Commander of the Sector Lower Mississippi she is our Coast Guard representative. As such, she serves as the alternate captain of the port, federal maritime security coordinator, 
federal on-scene coordinator, acting officer in charge of marine inspector. She also has active search suspension and search and rescue mission coordinator authority and is responsible for all Coast Guard missions being conducted by 225 Coast Guard men and women. Have to take a deep breath here. From 10 locations and aboard six cutters throughout western Tennessee, western Mississippi, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and northern Louisiana. Commander Waltower has served in many other positions and commands throughout the Coast Guard for over 20 years. Commander Waltower, will you join me? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, many looked at me as I walked around in uniform today and kind of thought, what is she? Uh, I know there are not many Coast Guard folks, or Coasties as we call ourselves, in this area. So um, just to start off talking about a little bit of what I do, obviously Leanne introduced me in a wonderful way, but I'm stationed in Memphis, Tennessee, and we do run the rivers. So uh, if you're familiar with the Mississippi River as well as its tributaries, the Wachita, the Red, the White, uh, and several others, that is, that is our responsibility, regulatory compliance as well as search and rescue, as Leanne mentioned, uh, and pretty much every mission that you may know the, the Coast Guard to do. So uh, that is what brings us to the rivers. That is why I'm stationed in Memphis, Tennessee, and why we have units in six different states here in the, the Mid-South. Mid um, my career started a little bit more uh, focused, I guess I would say. The commander said I wasn't sure that the military was what I wanted. My father was Army for 24 years. He was a helicopter pilot and I too um, was headed for the Army. I actually did Army ROTC at Virginia Tech. Was part of the Corps of Cadets while I was there. So I had the pleasure of serving and, and training with several services. Um, definitely a highlight of my life, I have to say. But clearly I didn't end up in an Army uniform. So my path went a little bit different. I decided uh, I did Army for two years in college and then realized that uh, maybe my grades need a little bit of emphasis as well. Uh, I became a teacher through Virginia Tech, and I actually taught high school for three years before I came back to service. Uh, knew I still wanted to serve, was absolutely drawn back, decided on my service uh, at the time, still thought I was going to fly doing search and rescue missions, uh, and went through officer candidate school. And so that's how I entered, but I knew from probably middle school on that the service was where I wanted to be, and had that slight detour of teaching, which I absolutely love and still continue uh, to do at every opportunity, whether for the Coast Guard. Um, I have my two children and my husband here with me today and uh, interface at their schools as often as I can. And then obviously the position I now hold is Deputy Sector Commander at Sector Lower Mississippi River absolutely leads me down much that same path. I do a lot of mentoring, a lot of guiding, and that is the highlight of my job. Uh, those 200 plus people and really with our auxiliary members, I don't know if anyone here in the audience might be part of the Coast Guard Auxiliary, but they are a volunteer force that we have. We have over 600 of those in the area of responsibility that I, that I run in, my AOR. Um, so I enjoy that. Uh, very much continuing the teaching and the, that interface is, is, like I said, the highlight of, of my current tour. Um, we were asked to speak a little bit about our leadership skills that we've gained, obviously, through the jobs. As Commander mentioned, each job has brought her a new challenge. Uh, out of officer candidate school, my first tour was on a cutter, what we call a cutter, um, a ship in the Navy. But uh, I was stationed in Sitka, Alaska. So that was my one and only tour on a ship. But I did drive the ship as well. I was an officer of the deck. Uh, we were in Aton. So Aton aids to navigation. If you ever see the green and red buoys uh, marking the river in this area, uh, obviously, at, at that point up in Alaska, I'm doing the ocean. We did the Gulf of Alaska and the Inside Passage. So if you've ever had that pleasure of riding on a cruise ship through the Inside Passage, absolutely beautiful. Um, we worked the buoys in that area and set those channels so that the boats could safely pass. Um, again, highlight of my career, first one right out of the box. A little bit scary, as you can imagine, headed up to Alaska all by myself, but uh, amazing, amazing experience. Uh, being able to take the leadership role, a little bit scary again, 
Um, those people on the ship were counting on me, as many of you in the audience, I can tell by hats and shirts and things I see. I think each of you probably has had that experience of being responsible for other people. Um, good or bad of the Coast Guard, as many of you probably know, the Coast Guard is much smaller than the DOD services. Um, that means early on you are given a lot of responsibility. Um, and you, you take it or it doesn't quite work for you. So um, great challenge. Enjoyed uh, being able to, to take that on right from the start. And then my path kind of veered into a different direction. I, too, did a tour in recruiting for the Coast Guard. I did officer recruiting for the Coast Guard, which allowed me to travel around the entirety of the United States and overseas. Um, I started school with my dad being Army. We started school in Germany. I was able to do a lot of traveling there, so it was wonderful for me to kind of get to do that again. Uh, from there, I moved into the prevention field, which many ask me what this little, what we call a shrimp fork on my shirt means, and that's my identifier for prevention. So um, to explain that, it's regulatory compliance, but also safety. So anytime passengers are hired to go on a vessel, um, even if it's a fishing vessel, if there's six or more passengers, the Coast Guard does regulatory compliance on those vessels, so the cruise ships as well, and many others. So that is the job I went into from there. At that point, I was solidified in that career path for the next couple of tours, which brought me to Philadelphia, um, to Washington, D.C., uh, and a couple of other locations, including Vicksburg, Mississippi, which again, many say, well, why would you be there? But the barges that you see move up and down the rivers, that was part of our responsibility as well. Um, they carry regulated product, and we want to make sure that that stays inside the barge and not out. So that's part of our responsibility. And unfortunately, when things go um, not the way you would plan them to, that is also part of our responsibility to try to figure out why that happened and prevent it from happening again. So a pretty amazing thing that I know many I, I talk with are unaware that the Coast Guard is involved with. Um, fast forward, uh, I was at Atlantic Area in uh, Portsmouth, Virginia, with Admiral Schultz, who is now our commandant. At the time, he was the Atlantic Area Commander. Uh, and then I was, had five different districts, Coast Guard districts, pretty much from the middle of the United States to the East Coast, that I was responsible for that prevention mission for that I just spoke about. Um, quite the experience getting to meet so many people from all over the place and seeing the difference between each region in the United States. From there, it led me to this job I'm currently in. Uh, this is one of those unique opportunities, and Commander said she got many of them as well. Um, I moved from being that prevention-centric prevention person to now being responsible for every single mission in the Coast Guard. A little overwhelming at the start, a little concerning, but as many do, grab the bull by the horns and you figure it all out. Um, don't have all the answers, but I have people who do. I have a wonderful staff that have helped me to get to know those missions that I may not have done before. Um, and there's been no greater feeling than being able to affect change, to influence people's lives and see them succeed. Um, that is definitively, at this job, been probably my biggest challenge, and that's one of the things they asked us to speak to um, for leadership. It's just determining how to best motivate each of those individuals that I work with, um, again, across a variety of missions, to include search and rescue. Um, many times we're having to make some pretty difficult decisions on when to stop doing a search, where to look, all of those type of things that you can imagine carry a lot of weight even beyond the workday. Um, so it's, it's been an amazing experience to, to learn those missions, be part of those missions, and see what an impact that makes across the United States and certainly in this region. Um, I guess I don't want to eat up too much time, so I'll, I'll leave a, we were asked to maybe share a little funny story that we have. So I mentioned that Admiral Schultz, our current Commandant of the Coast Guard, and I worked together uh, while I was at Atlantic Area. This April, as many of you are probably aware, is Month of the Military Child, so I know I mentioned my children are here, and I know several of our panel members also have their children with them. So I decided, as I was departing that last unit, We've never done an event, let's do one. Um, a friend of mine said, yep, I'll help you out, this is gonna be great. Uh, Admiral Schultz has several children, I believe it's six uh, children, so he's very familiar with, with children and, and how to interface with them, and he was gracious enough to come and speak to a group of about 200 children, uh, anywhere from a baby in arms to high schoolers. So during that conversation, some questions started to get asked. He had a rescue swimmer to his left, and a special forces, which yes, the Coast Guard does have, um, he had a bomb-sniffing dog off to his right with his handler. Uh, many of the children were asking questions, but search and rescue came up. And that rescue swimmer, Admiral Schultz, points to the rescue swimmer and talks about how he jumps out of helicopters to save people. 
Well, you can imagine, I think it was probably a six or seven year old raises their hand and mentions sharks. When you jump out of the helicopter, do you see sharks? <laughs> Admiral Schultz very graciously said, well, let's ask him, does he see them? And he answered, well, that started a litany of questions about sharks and have you seen them? Which ended with a question of, have you ever ridden a shark? Um, Admiral Schultz absolutely nailed it, um, had a great comeback, and pretty much said, you know, I have it, but I can only imagine it'd be pretty difficult to hang on. So he was phenomenal, but that's the type of individual he is. He's certainly been an inspiration to me, getting to work for him and now see him continue on and do great things for our service. Um, he, he embodied for me, I guess, the balance of we are soldiers, we are sailors, but we are also human beings. Um, that is something I've carried with me, obviously, in the, the command that I have now. Um, I was also a um, Marine Safety Detachment Supervisor, so in charge on my own of another unit when I was stationed down in Mississippi. And that is just absolutely, for me, that balance that I hope to always strike no matter what position I'm in. So with that, I will leave it. Leanne, thank you for the time. Thank you so much, Commander. That was great. Um, next, we have First Sergeant Camille Fowler. Uh, she is from Brighton, Tennessee. She is currently assigned with the 164th Airlift, Air, uh, Airlift Wing Security Forces Squadron at the Air National Guard Base in Memphis, Tennessee. Other duty stations have include Langley, Virginia, and Misawa, Japan. She has served for over 11 years, both active duty and air guard. So, for Sergeant. Good afternoon. Um, I will start with the beginning of my career. I joined the military when I was 18, right out of high school. Um, seems to be a trend of what we didn't want to know, didn't know what we wanted to do when we grew up. So I uh, was like, I'll, I'll go military and they can help me decide what I want to do. <laughs> so I joined at 18 um, uh, into emergency management. Uh, for those that served in the military uh, prior to 2009 when I joined, uh, that would be like uh, Seaburn, uh, chemical warfare, trained individuals on how to wear uh, the Seaburn, the gas mask, those types of things. So it's like, sounds interesting, I'll give it a go. Uh, so my first duty station was in Langley, Virginia, uh, Langley Air Force Base, it's Fort Eustis, Langley now. Um, I got married the same year I graduated boot camp and I had my son there at age 20. So I was a young mom in Virginia, um, but it was definitely a, um, a great experience being able to have a family and live on my own at such a young age. Um, about 18 months into being at Langley, I got military, uh, another set of orders to Masawa, Japan. And the first thing out of my mouth was like, do I get to take my family? Like, I was super nervous. I thought it was a tour by myself, and I didn't want to leave a four-month-old baby with his dad. Uh, so, <laughs> but yeah, so I, uh, it was a three-year tour in Japan where I got to bring um, my family. And in Japan, we had another child. I had a daughter. Uh, not knowing much about military bases, I did not know what to expect when I went to Japan. I'm thinking, like, Tokyo Drift, and I get to Japan, and it's Masawa, which is northern Japan, where we had like six feet of snow when I stepped off the plane. Definitely not what I was thinking. <laughs> but um, I learned how to snowboard, <laughs> and uh, it, was a, it was a good experience. Um, my husband is not military, so he's, he was my dependent, and he was along for the ride on, on all of this. Uh, we decided together that uh, maybe Air National Guard would be the way to go instead of continuing active duty. Uh, I loved active duty and being able to travel, um, but just with young kids and wanting to be back close to family, I got out and transferred into the Air National Guard, into the uh, Memphis, Memphis unit, the 164th. Um, when I got back, my first week there, they were like, do you want a full-time job? I was like, 
okay, so it felt like I was still active duty. I never left a base. I st still went out to the 164th every day doing emergency management. I worked there for about two years, and um, an emergency management position came open at the Memphis VA. Uh, as So I applied for that, and I got it. So I took that position. And then about two years later, emergency management position came open at the uh, Navy uh, NSA Mid-South in Millington, and I put in for that one and got it. So I'm currently on the civilian side. I work for the Navy base in Millington as emergency manager. Doing emergency management in the Guard and on the civilian side, um, I kind of got burnt out and was like, I'm, you know, I want to do something else. So I put in for a first sergeant position at the Air National Guard base and was selected. So last year I went to First Sergeant Academy and was selected to be the first sergeant for the Security Forces Squadron. Um, I did ask, I was like, do I get to pick where I go? They're like, no. And it was Security Forces and Maintenance, and I was like, I'm going Security Forces. They called me back and were like, congratulations, you're going to be the first sergeant for Security Forces. <laughs> uh, first sergeant in the Air Force is a little different than the Marines and Army. Uh, we're more for like the welfare and the morale for the troops. Um, still play. I still have you know that leadership role as a first sergeant, but we do like um, three to six year tours, and then I'll I'll be able to uh, go to another position. Uh, so far, I am absolutely loving security forces, even though I had my doubts in the beginning. Um, just being able to learn a whole new career field. Anytime they do training, uh, I'm like right there with them. I'm like, okay, teach me how to uh, shoot these guns and teach me what you know everything that I need to know about uh, security forces. Not that I want to go into that career field next, but it's nice to get to learn something new. Um, along the lines of funny stories, uh, the Air National Guard has given me the opportunity to travel and still stay home. I absolutely love that part. So uh, three years ago, I got to go to Germany. And then while I was in Germany, uh, I visited six countries in Europe uh, while I was TDY there. And then in 2018, I went to Hawaii uh, for a TDY and did two weeks in Hawaii um, where I had a boogie boarding accident and ended up <laughs> getting hurt in Hawaii, had the trauma team check me over. Um, cause it was, it was pretty bad. I kind of did the whole scorpion and, and skid across the bottom of the ocean and my whole face was beat up. It was, it was really rough. And then I know y'all all noticed my boot, um, and security forces, a 50 cal gun barrel fell on my foot. So it broke my toe in half. So I am accident prone. So, for, you know, I'm trying to uh, work on that. <laughs> um, but that is all I have. Thanks everybody. I want to say, when the word went out to the Air Guard um, to, for a volunteer, um, it was less than 15 minutes later, I got an email from First Sergeant Fowler. I mean, she was like, yes, I want to do that panel. So thank you to her. Um, <clears throat> Next, we have Sergeant Tasha Bowman. Um, Tasha uh, Bowman is a, um, she has recently returned from a deployment to Iraq. She is a full-time AGR National Guard Human Resources Specialist with 15 years of service. She holds a master's degree in family and consumer science from the University of Tennessee at Martin. She currently resides in O'Bion County, uh, Tennessee with her family, and she is a member of the National Guard in Dyersburg, correct? All right, uh, Sergeant Bowman. Good afternoon. So I don't have all of the experience that these ladies have, obviously. Um, I joined when I was 17, 
Didn't have any idea what I was doing. I was just as scared and stubborn as any other 17-year-old at the time. Um, I'd like to tell you I joined because I wanted to serve my country, but to be honest with you, I didn't know what that meant at the time. I just joined the military to despite my parents is what I did. Um, I'd like to tell you I was a super soldier from the beginning. I wasn't. It, if it hadn't been from, for some seriously outstanding leadership, I probably would have failed in the military within the first year of returning from basic training. But I was lucky. I had leaders throughout my career that saw my potential even when I didn't, and they still do. I had eight years in the service when I decided to take an eight-year break to raise my daughters and finish my education. That's when I achieved my bachelor's and master's degree. During that eight-year break in service, I worked as a case manager for children and teens. I met a young man who had lost his father and was having a difficult time dealing with things. His father had been in the Navy. This young man wanted to follow in his father's footsteps and join the Navy, but his mom wasn't ready to let him go. This was a source of contention between the two. I suggested a compromise. I suggested that he talk to a National Guard recruiter. I informed him and his mother of the benefits and the fact that he would be close to home, and after basic training, he could then decide if he wanted to transfer branches and go full-time. Fast forward a year later. I'm attending a Veterans Day program at our elementary school, and I see this young man. He's marching out bearing the American flag and wearing the patch of the local National Guard unit. I'm proud to think that maybe I had a little part in that man's choice to join the Army National Guard. During my discussions with him, I realized how much I missed being in the National Guard. He'll never realize that our talks had as much of an impact on me as they did on him. I started my journey back to the Tennessee Army National Guard just a few months after those conversations with him. It took almost a full year to lose 40 pounds and to raise my right hand again. So in May of 2013, I did it again for the second time, only this time realizing what it truly meant to serve my country. So I had that story today because she asked us to talk about something funny or heartwarming. I'm not funny, so I couldn't do that. But someone told me this morning of a story, and I, I would like to share it with you guys, if I can get through it. Um, she works at another armory here in Tennessee. An elderly lady called her yesterday um, and asked her if someone at the National Guard Armory could help her refold her deceased veteran husband's flag. Apparently she had called several armories and they didn't help her. This lady was very touching to my, to my friend that worked at the other armory. She's a staff sergeant and she asked the lady if she could bring the flag up to the armory and the lady said, well honey, I'm 92 years old so I really, I don't know if I can make it up there but I will try just so I can, I can get this flag refolded. She said, you know what, give me your address and I will come to your house. She got the lady's address, which I'm not condoning whatsoever. Don't take strange people's addresses and go to their house. However, she did let her leadership know where she was going. So she went to this lady's house and spent an hour speaking with this lady about her life and her, her husband and, and his service in the military. And she took care of this lady and got her flag folded. And the lady told her, she said, you know, 12 years ago, I was not expected to live. She said, I woke up one morning, my family was surrounding me, I couldn't figure out why they were all there, and they told her that they called them in because she wasn't expected to survive the night. This lady obviously survived. There was a reason why she had to be here for 12 more years. But my friend, she had deployed with me, and she told me, she said, you know, this lady made as much of a difference to me, I think, as I made to her. The lady told her that she had answered her prayer, that God had answered her prayer to send her to her because it was just this lady's prayer to have her husband's flag refolded. Something so simple and all it took was one person to change this lady's life. This story to me demonstrates the need for leaders to look beyond themselves and that sometimes it isn't the required duties that make the difference but the ones we choose to participate in. During my 15 years of service, I've not only learned what leadership is but what it isn't. One thing it isn't is easy. Being a leader is never easy. There are tough decisions to be made every day. You won't be liked by everyone. 
but a good leader should be respected by most. Leadership isn't sitting aside and delegating. Leadership is getting in there and working side by side with those at the lowest level in order to earn their respect. Leadership isn't taking care of yourself as an individual, but taking care of the unit as a whole. The most valuable leadership characteristic I've gained from the military is probably resilience. Resilience is defined as the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. The military will definitely do that for you. One of the most recent examples I have to demonstrate resiliency happened just last year. My first deployment ever. We were supposed to deploy to Cuba. During pre-deployment training, they sat us all down to let us know that we would not be going to Cuba, but that would be, we, excuse me, that we would be going to Taji, Iraq. Our first night in Taji was hit with 29 rockets, killing two American soldiers. That was the first of many attacks at our base. Our mission changed three times while we were at Taji. Then COVID happened. I promise you it affected everyone across the globe. We were not allowed to receive mail for most of the deployment. And if any of you have ever served, you know that that mail is your link to home. That's what it is. The letters from home, the packages from home, that's what, that's what links you to home. Then we were assigned to close the base. Then we were delayed getting home due to quarantine. If all of that doesn't teach you resiliency, nothing will. But resiliency is a necessary skill for leaders, not only for themselves, but for their followers. Leanne also asked us to talk about someone who made a difference in our lives. Our commander during that deployment seriously made a difference in our lives. He took care of his soldiers from the top down, even soldiers that didn't belong to him, he took care of them. Personally, I can only hope that I demonstrate half the leadership skills I look for in others and that myself and every female on this panel can represent each branch of the armed services and demonstrate loyalty to our country, duty to fulfill our obligations, respect for others, selfless service by putting the needs of others first, that we can make honor a matter of daily living, integrity to do what is right even when no one is looking. and personal courage by standing up for and acting upon the things that we know are honorable. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant Bowman. Next we have Carrie Mercer. Carrie served on active duty in the United States Marine Corps from 1990 to 1996. She turned 18 in boot camp, 19 in Okinawa, Japan, and 20 in Hawaii. She attained the rank of corporal. While in the service, she built bombs for the FA-18. And I may just let her tell you more about that. At age 21, she married a fellow Marine, and at 23, she gave up being an active duty Marine to be a mom. Her two sons are both serving in the Marines. The oldest has served 10 years and is the training officer for a reserve unit, and the youngest is starting out following his father's footsteps as an infantry, infantry assault Marine. She is currently active in the Marine Corps League, which assists fellow Marines in West Tennessee. And I have learned you never say former Marine. Once a Marine, always a Marine. Gary? Thank you for having me. Um, I don't have the time and service that the ladies on the panel have. Um, I'm honored and humbled to be here. Um, I'm going to tell my story. I'm going to kind of start in the middle to the end and then round it back around to how I actually joined the Marine Corps. Some challenges that I experienced while I was in the service. Um, I won't 
dwell on them, but sexual discrimination was definitely one of them. Um, in the Marine Corps, at the time that I was in, I was definitely a good old boys club. There were those that um, really tried to overcome that and help me as a young Marine and saw me as a Marine first. And, um, but, but there was still that experience. Um, having children was another challenge. Uh, we had a saying, if we wanted you to have a family, we would have issued one to you. Um, God, country, core, in that order, and if anything else that you did or had didn't fit into those three categories, it fell way down here on the importance scale. Leadership skills. Marines do more with less. Um, take charge, improvise, adapt, and overcome. Give a Marine a manual and we'll do our best to get it ha done, whatever it is. Time management is another skill that I learned well. Uh, responsibility for ourselves and our decisions as well as for those who we worked with and for those who worked under us. Okay, It's a very rigorous specific training that tears you down and rebuilds you into who the military needs you to be because how else do you train 17 and 18 year olds to run toward the sound of gunfire? Um, all of that led to difficulties for me in leaving service. By the age of 23, I had built bombs for F-18s. I was one of the first 800 Marines to hold the readiness list manager position where I helped rewrite the computer program that was used by those doing that job Marine Corps wide. I'd managed $4 billion in inventory, had six people under me, seven others that reported to me in direct contact with command in California. I trained some of my superiors um, I atten attended meetings with people who were several ranks above me because I was the only one in the office with the knowledge and the experience. When I got out, I lost my identity. I went from being the person I just described to being Sergeant Mercer's wife and Zach's mom. Um, I didn't even have my own name anymore. That was hard. And because I was only 23, 24 years old, uh, people didn't take me seriously. And those that did told me I was overqualified for every single job I applied for. So that was very discouraging. But um, funny story how I actually became a Marine. Um, I knew I needed a steady income and I wanted to go to college. Those were my reasons. Uh, the military offered both of those. My freshman and sophomore year, I decided I wanted to join the Air Force because I wanted to fly planes. Stepdad and his buddies, though, they were Navy. So they were, he was like, you know, the Air Force, your, your plane takes off from a base, and it has to go back to that base. But in the Navy, they put the planes on the ships so you can fly and travel and see the world. So uh, junior and senior year, I was all for the Navy. So my senior spring break, I went and I talked to the Navy recruiter. But after three days of talking, they still couldn't tell me which station I was going to go do my physical at. I'd already taken that uh, aptitude test to see where I scored and so forth, but they wanted me to take it again after I got to that station. And then depending on the score from that test would be what job opportunities were available to me. I said, mm, no, I'm going to walk out my front door with a contract in hand and I'm going to know what my job is before I leave. I've already taken the test. I know what my scores are. So, um, you know, I was 17 and I wanted my parents' input. I didn't want to have to make that life-altering decision for the, at least the next four years without their input. So, um, but, so I went home that day and I was very, very discouraged. I mean, this is everything I had dreamed of um, for the last couple of years. Um, well, the next morning my sister comes and she wakes me up and she says, there's people at the door and I think they're for you. I'm like, why, what, what? She's, they got uniforms on. Okay, well, go answer the door, and I'll be right there. So I went to the door, and it was the Marine Corps recruiter. And he looked all spiffy in his uniform, you know. But I was, the thing that impressed me the most was how prepared he was. He said, I see your ACT score is this, your SAT score is this, and your ASVAB score is this. Can I ask what you're interested in? Now, you might think guns, mud, and camo paint when you think Marine Corps, and that's what I thought. I'd never heard of women in the Marine Corps. Um, the, uh, <laughs> you know, um, and I said, you know, I, I wanna fly. And, uh, I, you know, thinking, well, that was gonna be the end of that. And he said, 
did you know that 40% of the Marine Corps is aviation? I said, no, I didn't. He said, can I come in and tell you about it? I said, you sure can. So three hours later, I had a contract. Um, I could, um, now, in 1990, women weren't allowed to fly in the Marine Corps. That didn't actually happen until 1993. Um, but he told me that the closest he could get me was aviation ordinance. And I said, well, what is that? And he said, building bombs. I said, hey, that sounds cool. Let's go for it. So um, I, I knew exactly which um, station I was going to take you know, my um, physical at. Um, I got bonus money for signing on for six years instead of four. Um, I was guaranteed rank. I was a PFC, E2, out of boot camp, and a Lance Corporal, E3, six months later. Um, the funniest part is that I never considered the Coast Guard because I didn't think they had planes. And because I'd seen that movie with Goldie Hawn where she accidentally joined the Army, I thought, oh, no, I could never do that because it'll be too hard. <laughs> but, um, you know, I wouldn't trade any of my experiences for anything. Um, it's my Marine Corps. It's who I am. I am a Marine. Okay, thank you all very much. I, I think we may have, um, do we have a minute or two for? Uh, okay, I think we have uh, time for a question or two. Yes, ma'am. So the question is, if there's a young man or a young woman in the audience today thinking about joining the service, what would your advice be? take that one. Uh, thank you for such a grand question. And the reason I say that it's grand is because we all have to decide to do something, you know. Um, in many instances, like I had stated when I was speaking, there are not a lot of individuals who come and tell you about all of the different options in the military. And as you saw, each of our panelists here spoke on very different experiences and very different opportunities, not only just pertaining to women, but to all genders. And what I would say to a young individual is to, by far, look into it and see what it is that kind of catches your attention because I think a lot of times individuals are kind of closed-minded because the first thing they think about is artillery, weaponry, and war when they think about the military. And even though those are things that we do encompass in our military forces, we encompass so much more. On this panel, we probably have more than three or 400 years of service here. Maybe not that much. I'm kind of embellishing a little bit. However, in my 25 years of service, I have not seen combat. However, I have seen lots of different challenges outside of uniform. So I would say not to be discouraged based off of what you think serving in the military is. And by all means, take advantage of all of the opportunities that could be afforded to you, whether it's the travel, whether it's the bonus money, whether it's the education, whether it's the leadership opportunities, or whether it's just trying to figure out what this thing called life is. Any other? Do, any other replies to that? We kind of had an idea of some of the questions that might be asked. So I would have just, and I, I still do, one of my daughters is considering the military. My thoughts are if 
if you want to join, female, male, whatever, set your goals, work to achieve them. Don't let anyone tell you you can't. Um, talk to somebody with experience. Talk to one person in each military branch and find out the answer. Find out what best suits you and go for it. No, he said your mic's on. Thank you. <laughs> I'll use this one. There we go. Um, to, as you both just mentioned, right, look at your options. It's an endless, vast, each of us, I think, had a preconceived notion of what our service was. I'll be honest, I never considered the Coast Guard, which is pretty funny now that I'm at 20 years and looking at continuing on. Uh, but look at the options. I have a nephew who's now doing intelligence within the Army, he had much that experience of he did not know what he wanted to do in life, but he felt like he wasn't contributing. So he left college and he joined the service. Uh, but in speaking with him, look beyond what's right in front of you. Look what can serve you both in the service and outside of the service. The, the opportunities are absolutely endless. That would be my advice, male or female. Can you all hear me? I was just going to say something funny. The Air Force, we sleep in hotels, and, and, and we have the best chow hall, so. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get that plug in there, right? <laughs> Any other questions? Now that you know what careers are available within your service, is there anything you would do different if you could go back and do it all again? I would have held out and become a pilot. <laughs> <laughs> I would go straight into college first and go in as an officer. I went in open general for my career field. Um, it's definitely worked out for me in the long run, but as far as um, the career field, I probably would have looked at some more options and actually seen what all the Air Force offers. Probably went IT just because you can make, you know, decent money on the outside. Uh, Air Force, they give you every certification there is in, in, in um, information technology. So maybe would have went that route. Um, I have to say I, I went in wanting to be a pilot. It was an 11 year commitment for the Coast Guard at that time. And that was a little bit much for me when I was unsure of staying in or getting out and how long I would stay. But um, I would say definitely go for that. Uh, but at the same time, I'm extremely happy that I didn't go for that because I've had such diversity in my career, I could never have imagined all the things I've gotten to do, so. I think that I probably would have not wasted as much time doing all of the things that I've had the opportunity to do. I think that I probably would have jumped right in head first and say, let me try a little bit of this and a little bit of that, kind of like a buffet. And so I wish that I would have known right on set that the military had so many different things to offer. I feel like at this juncture in my career, at 25 years, there's some things that I still wanna go back and do. However, they're only offered to the individuals who are coming in right now. So if I could rewind, I would definitely go ahead and jump head first into some of the other opportunities. And I think flying probably would have been one of them. Thank you, and thank you all for your service. I have a question, and um, just thinking back, has there been a leader in your uh, experience that you can think of that's inspired you? Just kind of a leader that you don't have to name names, um, but I mean some, uh, a leader that kind of stood out and inspired you? So I'll start. So this is kind of a twist on inspiration. Most people think of inspiration as someone who pushes you in a 
particular area and says, go do this, try this. However, I think my inspiration came from the challenges that I uh, acquired early on. And I wanna tell you this one story about one. So when I was working at the President's Hospital, Naval Hospital Bethesda, I had a senior chief, which is equivalent to an E8, who was in charge. And at this time, I was an E3. And for whatever particular reason, this particular senior chief, who was a female, was a very, was a stickler on all things hair. And I see my mother back there shaking her head because she remembers this. And so in the military, we have regulations about how you can and cannot wear your hair. And some of them are very strict. And back in 1996, they were pretty strict as to what you could and could not do. From the width of the bun that you wore, um, to the volume, to how many ponytails. At the time, we could not wear a ponytail to braids, the circumference, and things of that nature. And every morning when I would come in, she would come with a ruler and measure the width of my bun. I tell you, it was the most aggravating thing ever. And not dare me to wear a side swoop like I'm wearing today, because here came that ruler measuring to see how long it was. Of course, this aggravated me. It was humiliating, and I couldn't understand why. But let me tell you how that became inspiration. That became inspiration to me because it made me get into the regulations and find out not only what my regulations were, but what everybody else's regulations were too. And so, after about a week of this, when she came with that ruler, I was ready. I was ready, and that bun was no bigger than the two inches. <laughs> Not one strand of hair was out of place. I don't care what she came with, I was ready. But I was ready to measure hers, too. <laughs> and so that's where the inspiration came. So I took the challenge that I was approached with, instead of looking at that as a negative experience, in saying something that would push me in the opposite direction, I took it as an opportunity to grow, to learn, and to also have some type of weaponry in my pocket, which became a ruler. <laughs> That's good. I think we're working, there we go. Um, much like you, I think some of the leaders who probably challenged me the most or were, were most intimidating at the start, in retrospect, became those that inspired me most. Uh, you can't argue with the rules, right? That's the beauty of the military, or there are lots of rules and regulations. If you know them, if you don't know them and you learn them, uh, they become your friend, and you can use them to go and get what you want or to deal with someone that is making you not feel so comfortable or um, challenging you. So um, I know I mentioned earlier Admiral Schultz being particularly the way that he could manage being a human being while also being a sailor. Um, I've had a couple of different leaders. Um, for us, I know you mentioned some of the challenges of becoming a parent while in the service. So for me, we struggled um, and timing was not on my side. I was a little bit older. I was 25 when I entered the service. So, you know, when you're trying to have children, time is not um, necessarily on your side. The longer you wait, the harder it becomes. Um, and so I kind of got it into a point where they were asking me to choose between Coast Guard service or pursuing a family. That was a very difficult moment for me. And at that moment, again, placed into my life, I'm sure for a reason, was a captain who is now an admiral who said to me, you don't need to make that choice. So for me, that has stuck with me, whether it's having children, whether it's a medical situation or an aging parent, those type of things. We are humans, there is a lot to life. Yes, service is, is almost who we are for a period of time, but that ends as well. So um, the, the people who have taught me that, uh, that's what I carry with me. Absolutely. Good. Um, I do have one individual that sticks out to me. Uh, his name was Colonel Andy Troutman. He was at 06 in the Air National Guard. He was our MSG commander. Um, 
like I said, I just went straight from active duty into the Air National Guard, and I was the E-4, a senior airman, and he, he threw me into leadership roles and put a lot on my plate at you know, uh, such a low rank, giving me the full-time emergency management position. I was the installation emergency manager, so if it came to anything EM on the installation, everyone coordinated with me. I ran base exercises. I was, I was it whenever there was an exercise. It was like, all right, Airman Fowler, what do you got for us? Um, briefing 05s, 06s. Um, it was intimidating as an E4, but having that 06 there to push me and to guide me and to just develop me as a leader, uh, I would, I'd have to say him. He definitely shaped my career as, as it is now to be an uh, E7, a master sergeant slash first sergeant. Um, I owe a lot of that to him. Sometimes just... Uh helping you see what your potential is by pushing you there can make the difference. You know. Well, as I mentioned, I had lots of leaders to inspire me, but inspiration comes from many places. Um, I'm inspired by my family. I'm inspired by God. I'm inspired by these ladies sitting here beside me today. Um, it's amazing how even meeting a perfect stranger sometimes can be inspiring to you. But over the past two years, as I mentioned, Lieutenant Colonel Tyndall, he really stood out to me in taking care of his soldiers. He always had his door open for us if we needed to talk. Um, if anybody tried to push our unit around because we needed to be here or there or everywhere, and again and again and again, he would put his foot down and take care of us in that way. And to me, leaders like that, the ones that are willing to take care of their people over themselves, those are the ones that make a difference. I agree with what she just said. I had several. Um, my warrant officer um, was um, first and foremost in my mind when I was asked about, you know, a leader. He he really saw us as individual people, as well as the role that we filled, and then Marines last. Um, and I think part of his compassion was the fact that he was enlisted first and then became an officer. Um, so he had kind of been on both sides of that fence. Um, when I was, you know, I was pregnant and was needing to get moved out in town, um, we actually had uh, a friend of mine and I um, had rented a, a condominium and we knew that it was going to be, uh, it was up for sale, but it had been advertised for years and people had looked at it, but no one had ever bought it. So a month into our contract, the owners called and said, um, we sold it and they want median occupancy. So <laughs> we were scrambling to find a place to stay and, but money was an issue. It was all we could do to scrape together the funds to have the first and last month's rent and all of those things. And my warrant officer had pulled me off to the side and he said, you know, just how you doing? You know, what's, what's up with that? And so I told him, I said, you know, I'm working to find a place. You know, we found a place, but I don't know that I'm going to have the money to actually do the down payment. He got out his checkbook and wrote me a check. And he said, you know, and I'm like, wow. And he's like, I know where you work. <laughs> so he's like, you know, um, if, you, if you can pay me back, great. If you can't, that's okay, too. So. Really great stories. Ladies and gentlemen, these are your military members of today. Um, let's give them a round of applause. Aren't they remarkable? I am just so honored to be with them. I did not know any of them personally, except for Commander Williams before this. Um, thank you all so very much for coming. Uh, they will be around for a few minutes if you have questions for them. Um, this concludes our panel. Um, I just want to say may God bless all of our men and women in uniform and may God bless this great country. Thank you all so much.